Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Fallen Angel, Buzz Kennington, Data Magnet, and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again, and now on to the story. Story number 1. The Other Way to Skin a Cat. Written by Admiral Marsupial 3. The galaxy waited to learn the human's fate. They had always been brash and overconfident. Their qualities had actually endeared them to many of the older races, who were grateful to this young race for injecting some energy into what was becoming a stagnant galactic culture. Everyone knew it would eventually get them in trouble, but no one thought that they would be this stupid. The Nessian Empire was a major military force in the galaxy, the size of their armies and navies requiring the combined forces of five races to guard the border to stop any threat of an incursion into allied space, the humans being one of the races who boarded their territory. After one of the many border skirmishes had resulted in a particularly bad humanitarian crisis on a large frontier colony, the humans had sent out their red angels. They were an organization dedicated to helping those affected by combat. That had been formed when the humans had moved into space and unified, made of several organizations that had performed the same functions on Earth before FTL travel. Taking the most direct route to the colony that had resulted them crossing the Nessian territory briefly. But that brief in question had resulted in the ship being captured and taken back to the Ness Prime. The humans and many other allies were furious that non-combatants had been attacked and kidnapped. However, while their allies were pragmatic about what they could do about it, the humans were not. They made a public declaration directly to the Nessian Emperor, demanding their immediate return or he would personally face the consequences. The allied races were horrified. Not only had they made an impossible and empty threat, the Allied forces had struggled to force the current stalemate, so there was no way the force would be able to break through and rescue the ship. They had also personally threatened the Nessian Emperor, a being revered with almost godlike status amongst their population. They knew the response would be dire. They had asked the humans what the hell they were hoping to achieve with such an obviously empty threat. They simply received a cryptic response. There's more than one way to skin a cat. The galaxy watched in fear as the Nessian Emperor personally broadcast his response across the Milky Way. You humans need to learn your place. You do not make demands of gods. Your captured people will be publicly executed. Then our forces will sweep into your territory and extinguish all humans across ten of your worlds. One hundred million dead for each of your captured people that you want back so much. As he took a breath to continue, the galaxy looked on, some in fear, some in confusion, others in complete awe as a black-clad human emerged from the shadows behind the Nessian Emperor and fired a single shot from his weapon into the back of his head, turning it into a green mist in front of the entire galaxy before vanishing into the shadows again. Just before the feed cut, the whole galaxy heard the voice of John Mac McTavish of the SAS echo from the darkness. Maybe your successor will be more intelligent, you daft cunt. End of story. Story number two. The Starseed Project, written by C-SPAN. As far as plans for interstellar colonization go, it was fairly simple and surprisingly forward-thinking. Step 1. Glue a couple kilos of assembly nanobots and a mid-tier AI to an RCS system and sort a sail. Step 2. Using a combination of magnetic accelerators and orbital mechanics, bring the whole package as fast as possible at a neighboring star. Step 3. Wait. 
Around halfway to its destination, the soda cell opens, and if everyone has done their math right, the satellite will gently coast into its new home. Give the AI the goal of making the system as hospitable to human life as possible, and wait for the people to show up. Of course, as fast as possible means almost nothing when interstellar distances are taken into account, so the travel time to even the nearby stars would be measured in centuries. A few centuries is a very long time for things to go wrong. At assembly nanobots, we're cheap, so maybe send a couple hundred probes for redundancy's sake. And there weren't very many other uses for the magnetic accelerators. So it wouldn't hurt to keep firing probes at any star with an exoplanet or two until the budget ran out. The whole project got its start as a political ploy, a way for a politician to dazzle her constituents with her grand plans for the future. It worked a lot better than she'd expected. And since the budget for the project amounted to a rounding error for most government branches, she decided to actually implement it as a way to say, Look, I keep my promises. The whole thing was shuffled off to a hastily formed apartment that consisted of a couple dozen over-eager grad students and a few expendable middle manager types. Somewhere along the line, someone remarked that the whole thing reminded them of bits of pollen being flung into the wind, and the probes were called starseeds as a result. Nobody involved in the naming process actually knew anything about botany, and the inaccuracy was pointed out far too late to change the name. So the Starseed Project chugged merrily along for a few decades, spitting out a couple hundred thousand probes until the whole thing was axed as a part of a cost-cutting measure. Everyone involved patted themselves on the back, secure in the knowledge that future generations would be incredibly grateful for what they'd done. The hitch in the plan had come not from the star seats themselves, but the people who were supposed to follow them. Biologists couldn't come up with a cryogenic system that didn't have a horrifyingly high casualty rate. Boston and night travel was still a realm of science fiction, and nobody was especially keen to go on a journey their great-great-great-grandkids wouldn't see the end of, assuming that they didn't hit an interstellar micrometeorite and die on the way. So nobody went, and humanity felt largely content in its home solar system. Until an incredibly unfortunate and cosmically improbable gamma ray burst from a nearby supernova killed every living being in the solar system that wasn't buried under three kilometers of rock. Since very few humans lived buried under three kilometers of rock, if at all possible, the human race went extinct shortly thereafter and didn't feel much of anything anymore. But the star seeds remained. Because nobody really knew what was actually at the target star systems, the goal for the star seeds AI was deliberately left fairly vague. Simply make it as habitable as possible, as fast as possible. However, AIs are a largely uncreative bunch, and the ones that made it all ended up doing pretty much the same thing. First, the local asteroid belt was mined and turned into factories and ore processes and sensor arrays. And all the things the nanobots could do kind of okay, but something bigger could do much better. All this new industry was turned into two goals. The first was setting up planet-side habitats for the incoming colonists. The second was terraforming said planets. The first goal was fairly easily accomplished in a few decades. The second was much harder and had a time scale that measured in the centuries. But that was okay. It's not like the AIs in charge had anything better to do. As the centuries ticked on and the terraforming approached completion, the AIs began to enact even longer term plans. They would continue to make the existing planets as Earth like as possible. And when they were exact, sterile copies of Earth, new planets would be built to spec out of the gas giants and various detritus of the solar system. The project would take millennia, but nobody had showed up to tell them to stop, and nobody ever would, humanity having perished about 40 years after the first star seed reached its destination. And after the entire system was converted to Earth-like analogs, the AI in charge would pick up and move on. One system ended up with an impressive 208 replica Earths, 
or the most average to a dozen or so. When you casually abandon a few thousand planets that were specifically designed to be as hospitable to life as possible, life will eventually evolve to fill the space. It would be rude of it not to. So a few billion years after humanity had stopped existing, a once empty galaxy teemed with all sorts of new and fantastical sentience. And much of the new and fantastical sentience wondered why every single rocky body in the observable universe looked exactly the same, and why they all showed signs of being engineered to be that way. Many theories were proposed, from the mundane to the outlandish. It was a topic of conversation that lent itself to the divine, but no matter how outlandish the theory, none of them quite approached the truth. That the existence of them and every other species was the direct result of a mediocre politician looking to score some quick political points. It was probably better that way. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.